Okay, good morning everybody, uh, or good afternoon, uh, depending on where you are. It's a great pleasure to welcome you uh, all to our series today of events on crisis communication. On behalf of myself, Professor Penty Haddington, uh, and Dr. Rainuva Sikvaland, and Dr. Heidi Kiro Fellman, and also on behalf of our other speakers and special guests today, who you will meet along the way. Many thanks to you all too for joining this session online, and I know a lot of people are here from various time zones. And just so that you know who is in the room, we have got about 150 people registered for the different parts across the day, with a fairly even split between practitioner, uh, practitioner professionals um, and researcher academics, and we hope that you're all going to enjoy the day today. So you're listening from the programme that our time is split across three parts and we'll post the schedule in the chat again shortly. So what I'll do now is just provide a brief overview and reminder of those parts before passing to Penty Haddington, who will introduce part one. So as I say, in a short while, Penty will give a little background to the first part of today's event um, in which our crisis communication team of friends and, and collaborators will present their work to you. And then we'll have a little break uh, halfway through that, uh, just five minute comfort break at, at five to 12 GMT. After the part one, we'll have an hour for lunch. And during that time, feel free to completely disappear for an hour um, or stay in the Zoom or come and go as you please. And if you'd like to network, then just turn your camera on and we'll take that as uh, a display of your intentions to be available to chat. Then we'll start again at, at 14 uh, o'clock sharp uh, for part two, which is going to be the book launch for Crisis Talk. And we're absolutely delighted that Dr. John Sutton, who is the editor of The Psychologist, will chair a panel discussion with the book's authors. So that's myself, Ryan and Heidi, as well as special guests. And I think it's our special guests uh, who have been our collaborators and users of our research that make this book launch particularly special for us. And so they are Matthew Barstow, who is the Director of Telecommunications at Massachusetts State Police, Inspector Laura Burns, who is previously the training lead for hostage and crisis negotiation for Police Scotland, Ken Handfield, who is the Director of Dispatch Services at the Massachusetts State Police, <clears throat> Colin Harper, who is former operational lead for Police Scotland Hostage Negotiation Unit, and Chula Rupesima who is an ex-Metropolitan Police Superintendent in the Hostage Negotiation Unit and one of the main reasons that this event, um, it, one, of, one of the originators of, of this research and, and I suppose going backwards to this event. And then finally, after another break, we invite the professional and practitioners in the room to stay for a taster workshop based on our book um, and our research findings and insights about what is effective and less effective in live, in the wild, actual negotiations with people in crisis. And now I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Professor Penty Haddington, who is going to introduce part one. OK, thank you, Liz, and, and a warm welcome on my behalf as well. So and, and welcome to this part one of this crisis communication seminar. Uh, in this part, uh, there are three, seven studies or seven talks that explore crisis communication in different real life or training contexts. The studies have been published in a special issue that's been edited by Liz Toko and myself for the journal called Journal of Pragmatics. And I'm trying to control Liz's computer and it seems to be working now. So yeah, that's, that's the special issue. Uh, and I think most of the papers are actually available online already and they're open access. So I think somebody, if, if you can find the, uh, the link to the journal special issue, you can put it in the chat and everybody can have a look at the papers, by the way. Um, the special issue originates in a workshop called Talking Crisis and Emergency Situation that, Situations that was organized in Loughborough in December 2019. Uh, in total, 10 authors who are all in the photo that you can see contributed to this special issue. And the authors come from the UK, Finland, Sweden, the USA, Germany and Norway. Uh, we would especially like to thank 
uh, Loughborough University and Loughborough's Institute for Advanced Studies for hosting the event. Uh, the papers in, in the journal uh, special issue uh, approach crisis communication from different, different perspectives. Uh, first of all, that they study how people talk and interact, interact in situations that involve crisis, conflict or emergency. The focus is on situations that may be low in frequency, so they don't have happen regularly, but which have nevertheless high stakes. Uh, for example, uh, in terms of involving threat to life or even potentially death, or there are other kinds of disruptions to social order. Uh, the analysis involve professionals who have different roles in crisis communication. So, for example, dispatchers, medics, police, soldiers, and call handlers. Uh, the scientific approach used in the papers is called conversation analysis. This means that uh, all the studies study uh, live interactions. And the benefit of conversation analysis is that it shows how interaction in a given situation unfolds step by step, leading to some outcome or solution. Uh, the studies use audio and or video recordings from various hard to access situations which have been collected in the wild. Uh, the recordings come from real crisis situations or training exercises. The special issue complements the still small body of research on talk and interaction in crisis and emergency situations. So that's general background to all the studies and here's the schedule for the talks and, and the topics. So the way in which we've organized this is that we'll uh, have seven 10 minute talks introducing the studies in the special issue. And as Liz said, there will be a short conflict break in the, in the middle of part one. Uh, the rationale behind the order of the studies is so that we start from studies that explore real events and, and then we move gradually towards simulations and training. Uh, we're also starting from police negotiations uh, with suicidal persons, sui suicide helplines, uh, police lay people, lay person interactions, uh, and call uh, calls to dis dispatch centers. And then we move gradually again to training simulations in, in mass, mass casualty exercises or crisis management training in UN military uh, observers. Courses. Also, the first papers primarily focus on audio only recordings and telephone calls, and then we move towards uh, more complex multimodal situations and multimodal analysis of these situations. Um, uh, we won't have breaks between the talks. Uh, there'll be plenty of time at the end of part one. Uh, so 30 minutes for questions and comments. And, and what we ask everybody to do is to, to write down your questions and comments. You can also use the chat. So if you want to write a question right away, uh, please put them in the chat. And then we'll return to your questions at the end of part one. Okay, and now it's my pleasure to give the floor back to Liz and Ryan and Magnus, and they will be talking about uh, behind the scenes, uh, planning between negotiators for subsequent communication with Christ, persons in crisis. So the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Penti. And as we're already running a little ahead of time, what we'll do is is get to the comfort break. And if that arrives sooner, we'll have a slightly longer uh, comfort break. We'll we'll see how things go timing wise. So um, on behalf of myself and Ryan and Magnus, uh, our paper is going to focus on what happens when negotiators talk to each other rather than people in crisis. And it's one of several papers that we've written reporting our analysis of police crisis negotiation, working with suicidal people in crisis. And in addition to looking at what's effective and less effective in terms of the primary negotiator talking directly to people in crisis. Um, we've also been interested in parts of the crisis negotiation that research typically doesn't reach. 
And one of those things um, is how members of the negotiation team maybe recommend from the backstage and behind the scenes um, strategies for the primary negotiator to use with the person in crisis. So things like say this and say that. But today we're focusing on what we call the deep backstage of the negotiation. So the parties to a negotiation are the person in crisis and the primary negotiator, whose job is to engage them in a negotiation that will hopefully ultimately have a safe outcome. The role of the secondary negotiator is written about in the literature as maybe the most important um, in terms of supporting the primary negotiator. But we actually know very little about what they actually do in practice. And Ryan and I have written elsewhere about the impact of their participation in actual negotiations. But the setup that we're going to talk about today involves the primary negotiator, the secondary negotiator and other members of the negotiation team, all talking in the spaces in between the main negotiator, sort of behind the scenes, the deep backstage. And there are actually lots of opportunities for negotiators to talk to each other if the person in crisis is refusing to engage or they're asleep or if communication channels themselves are failing technically. So not all negotiation takes place face to face, um, but it might take place via a loudspeaker or telephones or, or so on. So what do the negotiators do when they're talking to each other? One thing they do is talk about communication itself. And it's this topic, how negotiators evaluate the scene, um, the possibilities for conversation with the person in crisis, the hurdles and the barriers that they're facing and so on. This was especially interesting for us. Uh, and, and what we can also learn from how the teams work together. So what I'm going to do is give you a taster of our observations across three short examples. The negotiations that we analysed took place sometimes face to face, on the phone, sometimes by shouting into a building or up on top of a building in all weathers, in all conditions. So let's take a look at a first clip where the simple, practical and technological pragmatics of having a good quality channel of communication all come sharply into focus. I'm going to play an anonymized clip to let you experience the deep backstage of a, ne a negotiation in real time. So you'll see the transcript and, and hear the audio. We were given access. Oh. I can hear someone's audio somewhere, if people could check that they're muted. We were given access to the data by police hostage and crisis negotiators themselves who initiated the project. Um, so Tudor Rupasinger, who is here today, uh, and, and his colleagues were incredibly grateful to him um, for the opportunity to actually co-produce this work directly with um, police crisis negotiators themselves. So here what we're going to see is that the, the person in crisis has barricaded himself in his flat and is threatening to kill himself with a gun. The negotiation has been happening on the telephone, and so whether the line is clear enough for him to hear him is really important. And we're going to join the, the clip as the negotiators are summarising a key aspect of what they've heard the person in crisis say so far, including whether they want to commit suicide by their own hand, by their own gun, by cop, that is to sort of induce the, the police to shoot him, or actually whether he wants to commit suicide at all. So here comes the clip. So you can see that and why being able to hear clearly what the person in crisis is saying is a, a fundamental resource to the negotiators, not least because this might be the only data they actually have uh, to plan their next moves. So I'm a psychologist by background and understanding suicidal ideation is a vast research area. What the factors and variables are that might help us understand what any person in crisis's intent might be. But most often, none of that information is available to the negotiators because they arrive at the scene, they don't know the person. 
So all they have to go on is what the person says and does. And from there, they develop their strategy. So obviously here, knowing whether or not the person said I want or I won't is really crucial to developing that strategy. So every turn uttered by the person in crisis provides the basis for negotiators planning what to say and also how to say it. So let's have another look at another clip from the same negotiation. We're going to join the team again as they discuss how to get engagement from the person in crisis to actually, including to actually answer his phone. Um, and here the primary negotiator is pondering whether to use another phone since the person in crisis might not be picking up if they recognise or have started to recognise the, the number uh, and that they'll know it's the police. So here, N4, who's a team member, but not the primary negotiator, gets the team to focus on the importance of what to say in the opening gambit. What those couple of lines might actually be, word for word, isn't specified at this point. Now, we as researchers analysing the practice of negotiators know exactly what it, it is that makes that opening gambit work, and we know how important it is. But we've also found that, that quite often the most common way to start isn't necessarily the most effective. And so since we've been able to describe very precisely what the negotiators do that does make for a successful opening gambit, hopefully you're starting to see the potential of this kind of research as a resource for things like backstage planning. So finally, um, the last area that we're going to look at briefly is what kind of evaluation the negotiators do of their communication with the person in crisis as they proceed through the interaction. And what we're interested in here is how the negotiators evaluate, evaluate what they're doing live, kind of constructing the metrics for successful communication right here in the moment. And whether this is actually better and more interesting and more useful than thinking about a more post hoc reflection of what worked or, or looking to sort of theoretical descriptions and models to what, what ought to work. So this is a, a clip um, from the same case again, and we're going to join the negotiation as N2, the secondary negotiator, initiates a new sequence about their potential approach to the person in crisis um, while they've got a bit of a minute. This is how it starts. So here the N2 starts this brainstorm with what else are we looking at finances as, as the first possible thing and then N1 references hooks and whether the kids might be a topic to get the negotiation moving again. And hopefully what you can see here is that N2 seems to build off that by asking do we look at family and those repetitions are there to ensure that he, he can be heard in the clear of overlapping talk. But it is interesting that N2 is not as collaborative as he might appear since he doesn't say yes kids is good but continues his own sequence of things to look at that he'd started earlier himself. And so here we can also start to get a sense of team dynamics, whose suggestions count and what gets, what gets folded into the plan. So to summarise then, what I'm hoping you've seen is the importance of looking at real practice to understand something that's minimally described in textbooks and articles, mostly without data, um, especially since there is the focus of research and training is mostly on the primary negotiator and the person in crisis rather than the team and how they plan. Our analysis shows what negotiators themselves actually say will be effective ways to communicate right there in the moment of doing it, as well as how they evaluate their own progress, building their own metrics for what counts as a, as a successful outcome right there in the wild. OK, and I'll finish there. Thank you, Lise and, and Ryan and Magnus. And we'll move directly to Heidi Kivo, Feldman, and Clara Iversen's paper on approaching institutional boundaries. So, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. Uh, hi, I'm Clara Eversham, and uh, I will start presenting our paper, and then um, Heidi will uh, continue. Uh, so, uh, emergency calls and suicide helplines assist callers in crisis by either sending emergency service to a location or talking to callers in emotional despair. In each of these helplines, callers displaying a high suicide risk may uh, challenge the institutional framework and test the boundaries of routine practices that call takers typically use to assist callers. And in this presentation, uh, we describe the interactional challenges for call takers in each of the respective lines and show how comparative conversation analysis can shed light on how call takers can manage uh, interactional problems. So uh, the paper draws on 20 first party suicide calls to a US 911 emergency call center and 80 calls to a suicide helpline in Sweden. And uh, this institutional guidelines in 911 calls prioritize collecting information about the caller's location and nature of the emergency to uh, be able to dispatch the approach, uh, the appropriate uh, formal help. Uh, practices for doing so include questions about information uh, regarding suicidal callers. Call takers are instructed to dispatch uh, response units as quickly as possible and to talk to the person until help arrives. The suicide helpline uh, provides emotional support and encourages storytelling, for example, by formulating callers' feelings. In case of uh, urgency, the call takers in the suicide helpline are instructed to encourage the caller to uh, contact the emergency line by themselves. And uh, Heidi uh, will first uh, start uh, to show uh, a case that exemplifies the interactional problem call takers face as callers make relevant responses that go against their institutional guidelines. Okay, thank you, Clara, and hi, everybody. Um, in the first call here, uh, this is a 911 call, and the caller has, in response to the call taker's initial question, where is your emergency, uh, said it's not an emergency yet, but it can become one. The caller has talked about a friend who is depressed, which we see at the end of line 29 to 30, and we can also see on lines 32 to 33 how he's working to tell the story uh, his way, which is something that we would expect on a suicide helpline, but which is not adequate in the time pressed situation of emergency calls. In this case, the call taker sticks to the institutional constraints we see at line 31 and explicitly states these constraints at lines 34 and 35. The caller finishes uh, abruptly saying that he will end his uh, line, which makes it this a clear case of uh, missed opportunity. And we see at line 37, what he says, an expletive, and then hangs up um, saying that he's just going to kill himself. And Clara will show the next case of the suicide helpline. Yeah, so our uh, case from the suicide line is uh, less explicit. Here, the caller has been screaming and panting, and the call taker has gotten a weak agreement on her offer to call the psychiatric emergency. Here we uh, see her asking for the information needed to fulfill this offer. And in contrast to how such a question is asked in an emergency setting, where is your emergency? She treats getting the information as hypothetical, which we see in line 45, and stresses the shift in control providing this information would uh, mean for the caller with words like dare and expose. So in this way, she emphasizes the caller's right to decide, and the caller doesn't give uh, this information. She doesn't give any answer, and the caller finishes when the uh, as the call taker says um, she can't do any anything more for the caller, which we don't see here. But in both cases, the call takers seem to recognize that the callers need something else than what the institution offer. However, their resources for responding to these uh, needs within the institutional guidelines are limited and their practices are understandable given the risks uh, of uh, blocking the line in emergency calls or um, losing uh, uh, the caller's uh, trust in suicide helpline calls. However, we did see examples where call takers actually use practices that are usually belong to the other institution uh, while still 
um, pursuing the institutional agenda of their own. And we will now look at those. So I will first play a case from the uh, emergency line. I'm oh, sorry, it seems to be mute here. Doesn't seem to be playing the sound, but I that's think okay. we have to do with it anyway. Sorry, <laughs> that's okay. Um, so in this excerpt, one of the things that we found in co uh, common pattern, especially in emergency calls, when a caller responds to the "Where is your emergency?" they'll often give a very vague, um, not fully aligned response. In this case, we see that. Um, I'm in my house. So the caller offers the vague, I'm at my house, which doesn't necessarily give the call taker the information to then pursue uh, sending help. But instead, uh, she focuses on the caller's problem, showing that she heard him in, um, so we have here, you wanna kill yourself at line eight, which is a full repeat and opens up a conversation with the caller to confirm and go on and talk rather than pursue, as we saw in the other case, what is your location, what is your location? So here the call taker's action and stance shows that she's aligned with the caller as a person in need of help and perhaps dipping into the service often found in caller help lines. Um, and then Clara, you'll take the next one. Yeah, so this case from the uh, suicide helpline starts as the caller uh, has said that she wants to die and will take uh, pills, which she then does. And we will see how the call taker fulfills an agenda uh, related to emergency service, getting her address while still providing uh, supportive comments and responding to the callers uh, like her control. Um, so I'm going to play it first. Hope the sound works now. Oh, for some reason it doesn't. Do you want to try resharing, checking the yeah, audio? Yeah, I will do that. that. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. And I'm just going to really quickly look at the, yeah, it seems like they're on. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, so I'm going to stop share and then reshare. Hmm. All right. Have you always... Did you hear that? Okay. Yeah. So here we see the call taker switching between actions that stress his right to ask and know, such as in line 3, 11 and 15 and 20, and responding to uh, her resistance as uh, he changes a request to an offer, for example, in line 6, and makes his actions conditional on her decision, line 24. And we have deleted 30 lines where the call taker pursues that caller's address and she offers her city, and she still uh, says that she doesn't want the police to come since they treat people who try to end their life as the weirdest, which we see at the end of in the final uh, example.
So here the call taker tells the caller things about herself, uh, but he does so focusing on her needs, not the institution's needs on lines three, five, and seven. The directive, give me your address, is similar to emergency practice, but the call taker agrees to the caller's condition with we will solve that uh, before he uh, uh, has his final request on line uh, 17, 18. And then in uh, line eight, 19, she provides her uh, address and he stays with her until help arrives. So in these two final cases, we see how call takers in emergency and helpline calls recognize callers need beyond the uh, institutional agenda and tend to these needs um, by moving between stressing their rights to know and ask the, and the callers rights to kind of direct the call trajectory. And in both settings, the call takers manage to display empathy and respect the callers right to decide while fulfilling the emergency agenda of getting an address to send help. So, uh, Heidi? Okay. Well, we're going to conclude our talk by saying that in, in our paper, we um, really found it important to do more comparative studies. In our case, we were looking at similar situations where you have the same interactional problem, but with different kinds of institutional constraints. And what we found is that we could really learn from one another and look at different practices. So when you start to notice how institutional constraints can impact the kinds of interactions call takers can have with callers, you can start to look at practices and methods that maybe are found in other settings that can help inform and shape and reshape the kinds of interactions that might not necessarily stall the progressivity of your institutional goals, but can actually help the caller along. And so that brings us to our last point that call takers in both settings can borrow from one another without abandoning their institutional agendas by responding to what the caller is actually doing in real time. And also then like in the suicide helplines, being able to demand things from the caller that training tells them that they can't do. Yeah, thank you so much for listening. I'm sorry about the sound problems. No problems, Clara, thank you very much. And let's move on to the next talk. So Samu Pehkonen will be talking, will be moving to police officer, layperson interactions, and especially how police officers respond to drunk persons, undecipherable terms. So Samu, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so I've been particularly interested in encounters between um, officers, police officers, and intoxicated persons. And for my article into special issue, so I wanted to concentrate on a fairly simple uh, but problematic theme. So looking at those occasions when the citizen um, cannot, due to uh, their intoxication, uh, produce meaningful talk. So my focus is on what happens uh, here after the kind of uh, uh, trunk turn, as I call them, how the officers respond um, uh, to these problematic terms. And my video data come from a Finnish documentary television program, uh, Police It, which shows the daily life uh, or, and daily work of police, uh, Finnish police officers. So these are real encounters with real uh, officers, real citizens, real participants, but of course the videos are a result from an editing uh, process uh, with the aim of both uh, making a program that is entertaining and entertaining and also educating. So this is a part of a, uh, public relations from the police side, of course. So uh, moving into the findings, so based on around 70 cases, um, I suggested uh, these five practices as a way uh, of how the officers uh, respond to these problematic terms. Uh, and the first one is uh, simply ignoring. So whatever the drunk person might be trying to say, um, for example, here in, in line three, which doesn't make any sense, uh, the officer treat it as uh, being yeah, uh, irrelevant for the ongoing action. So they continue what they would be doing otherwise. The second uh, practice, which is maybe the, often the most natural way of, of treating such problems in conversation, 
uh, is to initiate a repair. So to ask for a clarification, uh, maybe for a repetition or a reformulation, and this is what happens in line two. Um, and sometimes this practice is uh, extended by also giving a kind of explicit reason for not being able to understand what a, a citizen says. And actually, when I say it's an explicit reason, that's not completely true because they officers, they quite often use some kind of uh, humoristic expressions, um, like here referring to some kind of encryption that the, the, the speaker might uh, use and not the intoxication as such as the reason for why they talk cannot be understood. Um, now I will jump to the last practice that is because that's probably the most interesting and, and also problematic in terms of uh, morality and maybe the kind of uh, um, uh, applicability out of the yeah, well, anyway, the morality question, which I think is really important. So generally, uh, one way for the recipients of problematic talk is to just uh, is to suggest a possible solution uh, by presenting a kind of candidate hearing. So what a person could have been say, saying, uh, or what might be the intention of, of saying uh, uh, behind the saying something. And in typical conversations, uh, recipients candidate hearing, they, they aim to maintain or restore the shared understanding. Uh, and in the article, I, I talk about hijacking, uh, officers hijacking the other person's talk. So, so there seems to be some cases where the officers use the drunk person's uh, talk for purposes other than uh, trying to reach uh, the shared understanding. So here in this example, uh, the drunk person is trying to respond to the officer's question about her home address. And in line three, uh, the citizen starts by repeating first part of the officer's questions, uh, starting with a kind of acknowledgement token, ja, well, in English, uh, then followed by the kind of repeated word, uh, home address. Uh, and However, then the actual uh, information about the address, it's, it's in a very incomprehensible form. So uh, there is no answer coming there. Um, and the problem, it's, it's clearly noticed by the officer who starts to laugh in line four and then provides uh, his candidate hearing in turn five. And even though you probably, uh, you don't need to understand Finnish to, uh, see that there's some similarity in, this, uh, in, in the answer, in the, in the kind of candidate hearing. Uh, but instead of serious attempt to understand, the officer builds up a kind of humorous construction, which is, I think, a very highly uh, unlike interpretation that the citizen would be living in, in a guy called uh, Jaakko, Jaakko's uh, ice cream van. And I mentioned there's a humor already involved in the, in the line three, uh, uh, line four, starting to, to laugh uh, when the drunk person is trying to uh, speak. And the problem is, is also clear uh, when the other officer starts uh, uh, laughing and uh, making fun out of uh, the uh, inability of the drunk person's inability to talk. And uh, so the drunk person's inability to produce understandable talk becomes a kind of laughable uh, matter and a way of teasing. And although the officer later on, or, or here, he provides a kind of account for the problem that it's re really difficult to understand, the progressivity of the task has already been endangered. And in fact, uh, later on in, in the same uh, example, the drunk person completely refuses to cooperate with the officers. So the topic uh, and the cases that I discuss in, in, the, in the paper are maybe not strictly speaking very high stake examples. No one dies, uh, some might have a hangover next morning uh, and for the officers, they, they will be always the next new uh, drunk person to take care of. 
But if we take the idea about the values and, and morality, uh, like, like how a society treats its most, most vulner vulnerable is always the measure of its inhumanity and up, apply it to a uh, policing context, the idea could be something like this. How the police treat vulnerable people is pretty much the measure of uh, uh, public acceptability, public acceptability of, of the police. And I think these five uh, practices discussed in the article, they show that there are different ways for the officers to, to handle this type of very routine task. And sometimes one way is better than the other. Uh, and because of my data is from a television sh uh, show, so, so the humorous aspect is, is probably emphasized, but I, in fact, I have witnessed, witnessed the same thing in, uh, when I've been following the police training in, in Finland. So there's somehow the kind of idea that when you do this type of thing with uh, uh, laughing, so it makes them easier. But how do we know that when the laughing with the person becomes uh, laughing at the person? And I think this is also a challenge for, for the police training. At least in Finland, it's, it's, very, it's, it's still very much based on this type of uh, idea about apprenticeship. So the more experienced officer telling younger ones uh, how to do things, these things instead of uh, basing their arguments on, on uh, kind of uh, empirical research. And of course, my hope is with, with my article, and I think the special issue um, as such is that uh, how to incorporate these type of findings into, into also the, into the communication training. So I will stop here and give the floor to the next person. Thank you. Thank you, Samu. And the next in line is uh, Maximilian Krugs and Carola Pitsi's uh, talk uh, on rescue activities in mass casualty incidents. And I think Carola is here yeah, for present giving the talk. So I'll give the floor to you. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope um, I have a bad coach and I hope my voice will still be uh, understandable. And so we, will, Maximilian Cook and I, we have been looking at the at one, two, three, which is a practice for coordinating um, joint actions. So this is part of looking at teamwork and interprofessional emergency and rescue teams and moving a simulated uh, injured person's body is a very um, important activity and tasks to do. We see that in uh, moments of rescuing a person from underneath a car or from inside a car or um, transferring a person from a hospital stretcher to uh, from a, uh, to hospital stretcher. So this needs a coordinate act, coordinated action of several participants and it, it requires a simultaneous start and end of the action. And one of the resources people use for doing that is counting one to three and we have found that in a range of different settings from this emergency and rescue teams. So it's this very mundane and well-known practice. And it also appears to be robust, for example, when people have limited visibility. So <clears throat> we are interested in looking at how do people organize this task of moving a person's uh, or an injured person's body. Here comes um, a very short video clip. The language is German. The translation is given in English down here. I think one, two, three, the German is eins, zwei, drei. So there's not much more about um, language to understand about that. I'm just playing that. And we filmed that with an external hand camera. You see here a person lying. Uh, you don't see the person lying underneath the car, but you see the officers who try to pull uh, the person out. And here's a perspective from an eye tracking glass where you get a little better view on it. Ready? Yeah. Eins, zwei, three. So we see that there's an announcement of what to be done next, then ready, focusing and checking, then the initiation of this coordinated action, calling one, two, three. You notice the specific pauses in there and prosody. And then you see the coordinated action of pushing or pulling uh, the patient and the patient eventually saying, ah, kind of uh, signaling that it has been um, moved. So we have specific conditions under which these teams um, do this. And so they are constituted spontaneously, these emergency teams, they act under time pressure. And most importantly, they should not cause any further harm to the injured person. 
there. So coordinating is really important. Often, but we also find that this is problem. This coordination is problematic, and there's uncoordinated movement of the injured person, which also has been shown by Smith 20, uh, 2021 on mountain rescue teams. And so this has to do something with establishing a rhythm and also formatting of the instruction, but we don't know yet how this is actually um, done. And that's what we have been trying to look at in this paper. So we wanted to know how the detailed design of one, two, three, this very mundane everyday practice contributes to the projection of the moment when the start is due. Also how it is organized under different conditions with visual access or with limited visual access, and in the end, also the question how much position is actually required for, co for coordinating an action. Um, the data we are looking at here is training situations of mass casualty incidents. So a situation with low frequency, high impact, uh, such as large scale accidents, terrorist attacks, epidemics, where a large number of casualties need to be treated. And the beginning with limited rescue forces. And in the end, about 100 plus participants professionals are on board. And here we are just looking at one tiny aspect of this um, data. The corpus, we have got gathered so far six mass casualty incident drills, um, recorded that with a lot of cameras, mobile eye tracking glasses, a drone, hand cameras, so that we can actually get a grasp of the situation. And here we are just looking at a case collection of 12 instances from one MCI drill. Um, so our first question is, how does one, two, three work as a projection um, device? And we're looking at the situation with limited visual access, where the participants primarily have to rely on auditory resources. So the projective potential of one, two, three lies, of course, in the announcement, in the enumeration list structure. But then the more interesting thing is the idea of establishing a rhythm. So we see that there are two beats um, which suffice to establish a recognizable rhythm to which the participants can relevantly orient themselves. So we, here we have um, put that into a phonetics program and timed or measured the time between the different beats. And on the one hand, we see that they are rather regular with minimal digressions, but these minimal digressions, they seem to be um, ubiquitous in work on, um, on timing and rhythm structure. And then <clears throat> we see as well that the projection of the end of the joint action is quite interesting. Um, actually, for me, there's something hidden on it because the on my right hand side, can you actually see the prosodic contour on the right hand side? Seems for me, okay, cool. <clears throat> for me, it's uh, your, your face is being on there. So what we see there is that we have a specific prosodic contour, which is called an upward staircase with a slightly falling pitch contour which also shows with this rising and then falling contour, the, it projects the length and that's also the end point of the action. So this serves for the participants to also coordinate the end of the action. Then if you're looking into further data, we see that the two of one, two, three is a very important moment because it allows for last minute adjustments. So it projects um, already during the counting procedure allows the participants to um, adjust things. So here we have an example where we also have the counting one, two, three. And then we see that one of the persons starts to change the hand position after one and around two. And then is also ready with his hand in the right position exactly to push or to pull on three. And we see similar things with a team leader who can very closely monitor um, the situation um, or his colleagues when they have a situation with full visible um, access, like here when the person is transferred to the hospital stretcher. Here we have also the counting of the team leader one, two. Then he observes that the shoulder has not been taken care of. He can interrupt um, also around two, the movement, and then restart one, two, three um, after this problem has been taken care of. And then everybody pulls and pushes um, together. So then um, comes up situations where we <clears throat> wonder what about precision, what happens about the precision, because we see that participants then start, do not pull or push exactly on three as we've seen before, but they start to pull or push the purse on the loop of the, the stretcher already around two, so already before the beat, which is established. 
And this invites us to think about the notion of precision, which might be required when doing that. Um, here we see that in line 53, that around two, they start to push and pull um, the loop. And this practice has been evaluated as good enough by the team leader. So he doesn't seem to see a problem in that, which is different from the situations, which also has been shown from the mountain rescue work, where the lifting has been a problem. So what we see, or what you might need to think about then is also the way in which the, these loops are manipulated. It's a very physical task where momentum has to be built up to then be in position to lift or pull um, at the moment of three. And there's another phenomenon coming into um, which we need to take into consideration is intercorporeality. So we might also be getting to the limits of verbal and bodily communication resources. And there's some sense of sensing and intercorporeality in that which you might need to also want to explore further in this analysis. So we're looking to find a way of an empirical basis to facilitate the reflection of such professional practices by the professionals themselves and see that also now coming from this mass casualty incident data, we see that also in different other training situations, um, which we have been started um, to look at with colleagues from the medical department. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carola. I hope you will get better soon. You did well despite the flu, so thank you. Uh, so uh, now we have time for a short conference break, and I will ask everybody to, to hold on to your questions and think for more questions and comments, uh, and we'll return to them at uh, it's 2.30 finish time, so I think it's 12.30 uh, GMT and, and whatever time zone you're in. Uh, but we'll come back at uh, the next full hour sharp. <laughs> yeah, in nine so minutes. Time. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. nine minutes. Thank you, Liz. Yeah. yeah. See you shortly, folks.